something new show and I want to say welcome back as we learn a little bit on how to live a life worth celebrating. And today in the studio, we have Sharia, Sharia Rush. Thank you for being here today. And Sharia Rush, for those of you that don't know, she's a writer and a speaker who is passionate about telling the story of the gospel and watching how it softens and hardens, the, softens the hardened corners of our hearts and illuminates the dark rooms of our spirits. She has written for outlets such as Christian Parenting and She Reads Truth. She resides in Colorado with her two lovely children. She loves donuts, is a self-proclaimed Bible nerd, is passionate about keeping a soft heart in a tough world, making sense of the hard and holy season, and laughing deep and long. I love that so much because we started already this morning. We just met and we just went already yes. into yes. the story and I love how vulnerable you are on your social media yes. because you talk a lot about um just all that you've been through and mm -hmm. I think probably many people listening have also been through hard things yeah and your story is like jaw dropping you know I mean just in the sense of what the the roller coaster mm -hmm. ride has been mm -hmm. so um, we were we were in the middle of telling your story right before we started recording. Yes, and I kind of want to hop in. Okay, right there because I'm literally on the edge of what happens next. Yes, but just to kind of get everybody a brief update. Yeah, what would we? How could we get them to where I'm at in my cliffhanger? Okay, so I am married to my husband, and we are at the end of multiple years of trying to reconcile, trying to restore after just repeated betrayal and we're at kind of the climax of the end um where I have to make a decision to so leave. yes and you had moved across the country yes. you had experienced deployment yes. you had been given hope that things were going to get better you had had a baby mm -hmm. you're having another baby he's continually cheating mm -hmm. and now here we are. Yeah, now here we are. Here you are. So I, during all of this, um, I wanted to write a book. I was approached by an agency to write and I had pitched to all of the publishers and I just received an offer and I was getting ready to sign. And before I signed the papers, I had to confront my husband about just new information that I had found. And um, he basically solidified that there was not gonna be any change and that the marriage was essentially over. And so he left for a little bit and I remember I just went into plan mode. I was like, I can heal when I get home. I can heal once I settle down. And so I had a friend who let me borrow some money because I was a single mom or a single or stay-at-home mom for four years. And so I didn't have anything. I didn't have a bank account myself. I didn't have any money for myself. I just had his stuff. And so I needed to move, but I didn't have anything. So I asked a friend if I could borrow some money. I hired someone to get my car to Colorado packed up two suitcases and then two like little Tupperware bins with one with my books and one with my kids toys and I just left and um, made my trek back to Colorado and just we started over we stayed in my grandma's basement for a little bit while I searched for a place to live I signed my book deal on the plane here and just yeah started and what was that book about so that's the book that's coming out in a, in a <gasps> week or so that's yeah. the book yes ma'am <laughs> oh okay so, it's so that is the journey. book yeah. yeah so that is the book that is coming out and so I remember I emailed my editor and I was like the book has changed because I pitched a book of just staying soft in the context of reconciliation with my marriage and so so your you know, your thing was hey I can help women that maybe have been mm -hmm. um with someone yeah. that was unfaithful mm -hmm. I can help them stay in that type of marriage absolutely and I think I think my thing was less of like convincing people whether or not it was good to stay or not my thing was how can you keep your heart soft to the lord when you're going through something so devastating instead of getting so bitter yeah yeah okay so then you call your publisher and you say actually yes. i'm not staying married yes i'm out yes so i text her, i just the subject was like the book has changed and so we get on a call and she was so gracious and she was like this happens obviously life happens and so i remember i added a whole new chapter that day that was not in the original proposal and I just that's where I started the book off with that additional chapter and what's that chapter about it's called mirages and Mara moments and so it's basically about how sometimes we think that the way to a soft heart or the way to heal is to pretending is by pretending that we're not unwell and pretending that everything is okay and for me I spent the last three or four years just kind of 
dancing in a burning room I like to say you know everything was on fire and I was like it's fine it's good like avoiding the thing that was actually unwell and so the first chapter that I open it with after the introduction is just letting people know that you may not be soft like you may have some hard edges to your heart but the first step is acknowledging I'm not soft and that's okay God can do more with our honesty than he can with our pretending and when you say soft, my mind goes to like being a pushover. Yes. And that's what most people think. <laughs> but you're saying, I think tender. Yes. You're like, instead of being bitter and, Absolutely. you know, mad at the world and mad at the people and mad mm-hmm. at the church, mad mm-hmm. at whoever it is that hurt you. You're saying, say, stay tender to um, still forgive or tender to still acknowledge what was wrong, tender yes. to still be in relationship when you have to, because mm-hmm. obviously he's the father of your children. Yeah. Um, but but not necessarily a pushover. I don't see Absolutely. you as a pushover at all. No, and that is something that I'm really passionate about because I think that there is a misconception that softness is being a punk and being a pushover and letting people just use you as a door, doormat. But there is a quote by Sarah Polinger, and she says, we need to have soft hearts and tough feet so that we can do what God has called us to do, stand on our boundaries, stand firm in what he's called us to do, and not let a soft heart, it keeps us perceptive to his spirit, but it does not keep us vulnerable to abuse or to um, mistreatment. So, yeah, softness is is not being a pushover or punk. Okay. And so where are you at and how many years out are you from this journey in just kind of walking this out? And how did you seek healing? Um, It has been almost two years. Um, And honestly, I just worked. I just kind of kept my eyes down and just worked on rebuilding my life. And I was not focused on healing. I was really mad at God. I was really mad at him for a long time. I felt like I did everything right. I like saved myself for marriage and I, you know, didn't, he was my first boyfriend. He was my first everything. I did all of the right things, but it didn't lead to this fairy tale that I felt like I was promised by my obedience. And so because I was angry with God, I just didn't want to talk to him when I first got back. I just was like, this is my life. I got it. I don't need your help. I can figure it out. I can scrap it out. And so it took the Lord really being like, are you going to stop sprinting, trying to sprint out of the valley and stop trying to hop off of the operating table? Or are you going to let me just sit with you in your pain, in your hurt? And I'm not afraid of the honesty that you're mad at me. And so that really was the first step for me was acknowledging that God can handle my anger. He can handle all of those emotions that feel uncomfortable and like unchristian like. Um, he can handle those things and he wants to take those things. So that was the first step of healing. And then obviously practical things like therapy. <laughs> mm. Yeah. And I'm sure a lot of things with your girls too, right? Yes. Yes. So I have a boy. One oh, boy you have a boy and, and a girl. girl. Yep. And so that was a whole different element. Um, I think my biggest concern or biggest priority was to make sure that they, that I was not changing the story that they had of their dad. That's not my responsibility. That's not my job. My job is to create a safe environment for them to feel loved and nurtured and cared for. And they get to own that narrative with their dad. And so I think when you're hurt, when you're wounded, that bitterness wants to kind of interrupt the story and be like, well, do you know? And it's like, no, they don't need to know. Um, There's a lot that they don't need to know. And that was like a very hard thing for me because I felt justified, right? I'm like, well, I was hurt. I was the victim in this situation. So I should be able to speak my truth. But it's like... Sometimes speaking our truth doesn't uphold honor and safety um, and love for the people on the other side. Mm -hmm. Well, and you did a very brave thing by going online and talking about it. I mean, Shreya, you have lots and lots (laughs) of people watching you online. I don't even know the latest count, but there's there's a big number of followers, big. Mm -hmm. And so I just wonder what made you think one day as you're going through this very painful process, like, you know what? I'm just going to talk about it. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to get, get real online. People like it. Great. If they don't, they'll, they'll scroll over, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. but what made you decide one day? I think I'm just going to go yeah. online and talk about this. It was really just obedience. I just really felt the Lord was telling me like, obviously with boundaries, with wisdom, um, but that it was that there was a portion of my healing on the other side of my vulnerability. And I can say now that that was very true, but it did also 
come with its own aches, right? You can become the girl. Like there was a point where I was the girl that represented reconciliation. I was the girl that represented someone who separated from her husband and then got to back together with them. And so stuck around yeah, after yeah. Um, unfaithfulness. Exactly. And there were a lot of women that were following me because of that, right? Because I was a mirror for their story. But then when I, it, everything changed, I saw like people just didn't connect with me in the same way because my story was different. And so I think that I had to grieve that as well of like the expectations of people um, and how that bumps up against our ability to change and mm -hmm. change our minds. And that is a tension that we don't, that's not comfortable. It's not. Well, and all of us don't exactly have the same circumstances. Right. So, so while we can identify with a lot of people online, mm -hmm. they were like, oh, she gets me. She yeah. has a lot of the same things. So like her choices should be my choices. Mm. It's not always identical. And so exactly. it, there's a lot of similarities, right? And right. we can learn from people from the similarities. But I always say, while this may seem what's right for you, mm -hmm. I had to make this choice for what's right for my family. Absolutely. And so please do what you still feel like God's telling you, you to Absolutely. do. And I don't want to live in the land of like, just because I chose this doesn't mean it's, you have to choose that. Exactly. And I've had women that would reach out to me like, hey, I saw your story. This is my story. What do I do? And it's like, I... Oh my gosh. It, it's, it's like weighty. A lot of know? pressure. Yeah. It is weighty. And I just got to the point where I'm like, you know, like you were saying, like principles similar principles can be applied in the same situations, but that doesn't mean they look the same, like you were saying. And so I think that when we look online, we see someone that's going through the same thing as us, but they're not going to sleep with that decision. You are. Mm -hmm. And the peace that you will find is the fact that you know that you made the best decision for your life and you have to sleep with that decision. And I will be honest, sometimes I was like, why did I leave? Like, even though I know it was the right thing, I was just like, why did I leave? I'm here with no money in my grandma's basement. I am back in the town that I thought I had left behind. Um, but yeah, people, the biggest thing we can do and the best way we can take care of ourselves is taking information, but then taking that to the Lord and asking, how does this apply in my life? Like, what does wisdom look like for me? Mm -hmm. And he knows all of our circumstances yeah. in detail Yeah, where the person that you're giving highlights to does not. No. I mean, as much as we could sit here and I could hear your story for two more days, mm -hmm. there's still more. Absolutely. And you have to really just actually seek the wisdom of somebody that is the mm -hmm. only one that knows all the details. Yes. <laughs> because, yes. you know, that's a weighty decision too with kids involved mm -hmm. and just the simple provision. How am I going to eat? Yeah. yeah. You know, like those are very big decisions. It is. And it's devastating, but God. Restores. What's been like the coolest thing that has come out of you going online with your story? Oh, man. Um, the coolest thing. <laughs> yeah, just some things that you're like, I this think, is why I did yeah, that post. Yeah, I think as weighty as it is to get women, have women come to me and ask for advice, it is also beautiful to just have the ability to be a comforting voice to women who are really lost. I don't think the church handles tough conversations like these very well. Um, mm. And I don't think women feel like they have a safe place to be honest about what they're going through. And I am in no way, I'm not like a divorce to everybody if he makes you mad today, you know. But there are women that are going through very real situations and real and hard things. And I think sometimes we elevate the institution of marriage over the person um, that was made in God's image. And so the coolest thing for me has just been able to sit with women that I, I will probably never meet in real life. Um, but just be a voice that's like, I see you. I know it's hard. I know you want to do right by God. Like that's the core of your heart. Um, but also just know that God cares about you and your safety and your heart. And it's okay to make that decision with that in mind. Yeah. I think, yeah, just having that freedom to know there are many times when divorce is the right option because a lot of times <gasps> we've made, oh I know gosh, you're gonna be canceled. <laughs> I'm going to be canceled. I know I've, I've encouraged friends at times, you know, or mm -hmm. people I've mentored or whatever. This is not a good circumstance. It's not a good situation. Yeah. And yeah. it's, there's, there's, um, something that my husband and I say, and I can't take it. Like I own this idea, yeah. Dr. Henry cloud, okay. necessary him. endings, all of those things. I mean, he is a brilliant person. Um, but you know, when a situation, when a situation becomes hopeless, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like there's absolutely no more hope because you've done everything you can mm -hmm. and the other person just refuses to change. Yeah. There's no more hope for this to, 
to improve. And I, the way I feel about this is, is like, just in your circumstances, you kept trying and the person yeah. you're with did not desire mm -hmm. to change his, mm -hmm. um, pattern of unfaithfulness. Yeah. And so I don't think that's right for you to stay. Yeah. Um, even though you tried and you wanted to, mm -hmm. and for the sake of the kids and all the things we say, mm -hmm. but then there's people, Sharia that use this as an excuse yes. to get divorced when yes. really they are the people that should don't want to get out. Work. Yeah. They don't want to do the work. So I will say that as well as that I have also encouraged friends too to mm -hmm. say, Hey, have you done all you can? Absolutely. Because you're blaming a lot on this other person, but what have you done mm -hmm. to improve your relationship? Yeah. But, um, it takes two it to really be in the midst and to say, we're here to fight this out. Like yeah. we're going to make it work yeah. and it's not easy. I've been married almost 20 years. Wow. I totally get it. But what I really would love to talk about with you is how surprising people feel there. I think that we know the world has bad things that happen, yeah. but when it happens to you mm. that you have done all the right things mm -hmm. and it doesn't add up for you to have something crazy bad happen mm -hmm. and what your story was is like you, you told me just a minute ago, yeah. just that, well, you can share it and I'll share with mine. Why, yeah. how I was like, I did all the right things and this happened, but tell everybody what you did everything right in, mm -hmm. in the world's eyes to like yeah. get a good marriage. Right. Um, I mean, I grew up during purity culture time, so it was all about saving yourself yeah. and, um, being the delicate flower and not letting people just take petals off and, you know, opening the box, all of the I kissed dating goodbye yeah, and all I, that stuff. Listen, that was my favorite book. Um, <laughs> I, it was marked up. It's embarrassing. Oh it was marked gosh. up. That's so I, that was what I grew up on. And so I don't think that, I think that how the message was being presented was very hard for women specifically, because it's like, if you follow all of these rules, if you do this and that and this and that, you'll have the perfect marriage. And that's Dress just not this way. Modesty. Don't tempt your brothers. Like just everything. If you become just this robot of purity, which that is an aspect of purity, but that's not just, you can have a very unpure heart and be modest as well. Absolutely. Um, and so I, yeah, I went into marriage. Like I, I did. I earned did this. I earned this. This episode is sponsored by something blue 30 a looking for the perfect vacation spot to disconnect from everything. Put your feet in the softest sand and enjoy a fresh renovated two bedroom, two and a half bath townhouse right on the beach in my favorite place in the world. Well, 30A is situated in the Panhandle of Florida, and I'd love for you to check out Something Blue 30A on Instagram and make it the perfect place for your next vacation. This amazing marriage mm -hmm. came to me. Because I did the right thing. And I mean, that was quickly disproven within a couple months of marriage because you're marrying a whole human being with their own stuff and flaws. Um, but I think that there is a human desire to wager with God, to bargain with God. And I think back to the parable of the lost son, and we typically just highlight the lost son who ran away, right? And he came back, the prodigal son who ran away, he came back, he was the lost one. But the older brother, God could have stopped the story at the lost brother came home at the end. But he took time to talk about the older brother who was upset. And he was like, I've been in that field all day long. And like, you didn't give me this party. You didn't do this to me for me. You didn't do that for me. And I think that when we have been so, you know, conditioned by church culture in a lot of ways. We begin to add things to the text. We begin to add things to God's word. And we say to ourselves, like, yeah, I can do right by God and he will do right by me. And the truth of the matter is my marriage falling apart was not God not doing right by me. It was somebody else's choice. That was his choice. And God gives us free will. And so there is still goodness that I'm experiencing, but it's not always going to look the way that I want it to look. Mm -hmm. And I like, that's the biggest surprise I've seen time and time and time and time again mm -hmm. with all these people I've talked to over the last 20 years about life. Yeah. Like I, people ask me in my little thing, most people know, but is that my son got cancer at wow. three years old. He's wow. in remission doing good. But what I was like, just surprised by is that, you know, I fed him organic formula. Mm -hmm. He never had a baby, like, or sorry, it went to daycare. Like we had a in-home babysitter that was watching our kids. Like I was super healthy. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we went outside every day and got vitamin D. We did all the things that like wow. in a health circumstance yeah. should equal a healthy outcome and a healthy person. And he still got cancer. Mm -hmm. And so 
it was very shocking for me. And that's what I was saying is like, it doesn't matter the circumstance. It could be a failed marriage yeah. and you did everything right. It could be somebody gets cancer and they did all the right things and should not be the one to get cancer. Right. My husband is the most healthy habit person I've ever mm. met. It's like he's Enneagram three and likes okay. to check off all the boxes in the morning and everything. And, and at 39 years old, he got COVID and type one diabetes at the same time. Wow. He type one is the kind that's an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. It's not because of your lifestyle at 39 years old with no family history. Wow. So I'm like, he should not be getting this right, right now, right. but he is now insulin dependent for forevermore. Yeah. And mm -hmm. it's very frustrating. And that's just my up close. I could tell you hundreds yeah, of stories as you absolutely. could as well of all these women, all these men that have literally done the right thing. Cause this could also be the men, right? That the absolutely. women was unfaithful. They yeah. were unfaithful, whatever. The point is, is like, I think what is crazy shocking is the wager belief that if I do all these right things, I absolutely will have this outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think we could really tell people that's not how it works. And no. No. There's nothing you can do to earn God's love. Yeah. There's nothing you can do to, um, you know, kind of coerce a circumstance right. to happen. Right. Like I really believe it's God that opens doors and closes doors. Mm -hmm. Um, now do we have some good, healthy control? Yes. We have some basic things, right. but when we start to go beyond those basics, we really don't have much. Mm -hmm. And when we get beyond those basics, I think we start to lose, um, sight of really who is in control. Yeah. And then yeah. we get so messed up because yeah. we're like, wait, in the world, I did the right thing. I did the right thing. And so ultimately like the things that I have control over today is like what I put in my mouth, mm -hmm. how much exercise I get, how I treat the people in my yeah. world, yeah. but how they receive that is not my control. Mm -hmm. How my business outcomes are not in my control. How, mm -hmm. like when you get in a marriage, yeah. how they show up every day is not in my control, but I'm going to do my best yeah. and yeah. I don't do it for the outcome anymore. I yeah. just do it because he asked me to. Exactly, because you love him. Uh huh. You love him. And it used to be because I thought A plus B got right. you to C. And it just, I think there's people that are just stuck there. You know, they they haven't grown because they're just so disillusioned by the disappointment. And that's real. That's real. And I don't want to sit here and be like, you shouldn't feel disappointed. Like, disappointed. And mad. Like, yeah. it, it, it's real. It's a real thing. But just taking that journey with God and, and realizing you can't manipulate his hand. And that's actually good news. That yes. is actually good news. Oh, it's such a relief to not be in control. Yeah. But it's also like just getting back to that square one is like, what is your motive in doing what you do every day? Right. Because are you doing these things to get to a certain outcome when ultimately you can try? Yeah. And hopefully it works out. But if you hold that loosely, you're going to be a much happier person. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can see the different forms of goodness, right? It may not be what you defined as good, yes. but it could be what God is presenting to you as this is, this is, this what is, is really good. good. Yeah, this is really good. And you're going to thank me later. Yes. So good. Okay. I want to talk about, um, courageously soft, daring to keep a tender heart in a tough world, because this is coming soon. It is. Okay. It so a baby that I feel like has been inside of you yeah, is finally coming out. So tell me like the premise. I know we talked yeah. a little bit about it earlier, but it's basically just talking about what God has to say about having a hardened heart and having a soft heart. It's something that he speaks about specifically to his disciples and to the lovers of the law. It's not a message that he ever presents to people who didn't care to know him or weren't already following him. It was to people that were one, the closest to him and the people who thought they knew the most about him. And so I wrote the book just because it was kind of coming off of 2020. We're in like racial upheaval, we're in political upheaval, and then it's a pandemic. And I just started to notice how we weren't like, the state of our heart was affecting our relationships, it was affecting our conversations. And I started having these dialogues online and that just kind of led towards what does it look wow, like? Wow, you went there too. Yeah, it was it was very hard. <laughs> Sharia, brave girl. Uh, so when I first actually started online, it was Coco, my handle was Coco Gospels and I just talked about race in the church. And so that was the Pre hardest. Pre-2020? This was in 2020. Like George Floyd had died and then I started talking about it. And so I just, 
I was just taken aback a lot by the conversations and by just the unwillingness. We don't have to agree, but the unwillingness to come to the table with a tenderness that would uphold the image bearer that's across from you, you know? And so that's kind of how the book started. And then it grew, obviously, to my personal narrative and just seeing how I was told my whole life, like, you can't be soft. Like, you can't be a crybaby. You can't be sensitive. Like, you've got to toughen up. And you won't survive if you don't toughen up. And that just felt so counter, like, how God wired me. Like, it just felt so contrary to how I was. And so I just felt like, okay, there must be other people who feel like their sensitivity and their softness and their tender heart is like a curse. And I want them to know that it's not. It's actually a blessing. It's actually a miracle. It's actually the fullness of God's glory on display in this really broken world. And so that's just how the book kind of... That's probably that tenderness has probably really allowed you to have those hard conversations. Yeah. Because I'm sure you've heard things that were absolutely stupid. <laughs> yeah. I've heard a lot of things like just just mean things, ignorant silly things yes yeah. ignorant small mindset mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. but if you weren't tender yeah it wouldn't have even happened yeah you wouldn't even have those conversations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so did you change the instagram name then because of i the book or the no, journey or what I was it changed it to my name um because i just was ready to be more than just the girl that talks about race i think that people became just a little too comfortable coming with me with certain questions that were just like, that's a Google, you can Google that, or you're just trying to be not a, a good faith ask or a good qu faith question. And so I just thought the Lord was like, okay, it's time. It's a new season. It's, you've grown your following doing this, but I think I want you to talk about more than just that. Um, and so I changed my handle after mm. a couple of years. And so will there be any sort of kind of conversation about that in the book? You know, there is nothing not, about race. Mm -mm, it's more no. about, um, it's like, more about just, yeah. Like the practical things, forgiveness, cynicism, things that make our heart heart hardened and then ways to keep our heart soft. Mm. Um, who knows in the future, maybe I just am like, whew, I don't have that much of tough skin for race conversations all the time, but I've, I'm used to it. I've grown up here. And so I'm used to like navigating those conversations mm -hmm. and it's not, I'm not intimidated by them because mm -hmm. I think I, I think I don't go in like I'm trying to convince you of anything. I'm just going in like, let's just talk. And we may just, we may both walk away with the same very different opinions, but you can actually hear a different perspective. And that's worth more than people think. It's a beautiful place to be. It's mm -hmm. one of my favorite things to do is yeah. to just have those open heart, uh, open hearted conversations. Mm -hmm. But I absolutely agree with you. It's like, it's sad to me that people have stepped away from having them because yeah. everyone's heart is so hard. I know. You can't just like say, okay, so how did this make you feel? Mm. Or how, when the, this happens yeah. and like, but vice versa, do you know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. there's been a, a, a lot that I just wish people could be open about and say, yeah. Hey, here's where I'm like, where do we go from here with racial, right. racial tension? Right. Sometimes it feels like we're going backwards yes. when we came so far. Right. And then we're yeah. going backwards sometimes. I'm, and I, I am hopeful though about mm -hmm. this. Actually, mm -hmm. I actually have hope about this. Yeah. Um, first of all, because I do believe in God, mm -hmm. but then I also still think there's many people Absolutely. still out there doing the work. Yeah. And I think that if we're being honest, the extremes hold the microphones, the extremes hold the platforms. And because of that, we can convince ourselves that the people on the extremes are the ones that are the majority, but the majority is the middle. There's more of us that are willing to have conversations. There's more of us that are willing to put down our differences and not make our whole personalities our you know, political opinions. There are more of people in the middle than the mm -hmm. extremes, but the extremes have the platforms. The, the platforms. Yeah. And I always tell people, I said, we actually probably have more in common than we have not in common. Absolutely. Like there's probably more similarities in our value system mm -hmm. than the differences. Mm -hmm. But sadly, I do feel like it's spiritual, but sadly, I do feel like the enemy wants to highlight the differences yep. because they divide. Yep. And then we just overlook the 95% of the mm -hmm. values that are the same. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, yeah. you know, just a whole nother whole episode, other. right? <laughs> right. Whoa, a whole nother episode. Well, if people wanted to, um, hear more about you, where should they go? Um, my Instagram is Sheree Rush. And then I also have my website, Sheree 
and uh, my Substack blog is there as well. Oh, so, Substack. Yeah. Okay, yeah. girl. I love it. Tell me, where are you going to be this year? Are you going to be talking in oh, any fun places? I'm not. I. You're going to lock into the kiddos. Yeah, and I have another job. I work for a nonprofit in town, so I am just, yeah. I'm pretty, pretty stretched thin. So I'm just focused on working my babies and just building our life together. As a single mom. Yep. Do you have split time or anything or do you have them all the time? I have them most all the time. So you're doing the grind. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Any tips for single moms out there? Oh man. Um, working single moms. Yes. I would say, and this is probably not going to sound very helpful, but, um, you don't exist to prove people wrong. Um, I think when I became a single mom and I came back here, I felt like I had this huge scarlet letter on my chest and I was just like, I'm just a statistic now. My kids are officially from a broken home. And I went into this place of like, I have to prove everybody wrong. I have to prove everybody, prove to everyone that like, I can be successful and I can provide for us. And that's just not our job. Like we live in the freedom of just living. And just because our circumstances change doesn't mean we have to go into this mode of trying to prove to everyone that we're worthy of having respect. We're worthy of, um, you know, love and all of those things. And so for me, it was just like, I'm not going to live my life trying to prove people, prove to people that single moms can be more than just a statistic. I'm just going to live my life and let it speak for itself. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And how old are your kids now? A six-year-old and a three-year-old. And are they in full-time school yeah, or a program? One is in school full-time and one is in daycare full-time. Okay. Yeah. So they're And do you have supportive family? Or? Uh, my mom is here, which is great. And then my church family has been really helpful as well. That's awesome. Yeah, it's good. Okay. Still well, hard, good. let's talk about your favorite drink. Oh, we're about <laughs> to bring this out here, girl. Oh, my goodness. I'm like, you are from Ooh. Atlanta. Well, you not really. Know, You're not from really Colorado, as well. but that impacted your life because look at your favorite drink. What are we drinking today? Okay, a Diet Coke. I just love it. I don't know. It just <laughs> happened. Like after I had my daughter, it became my favorite drink. And you were living in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. yeah. So and I, mean, I remember my aunt took me to like the Coke Museum. Yes. When I was 16. And so it's just always been a thing. Well, are you a Pepsi person? You're a I no know, bubbles person. I'm a no soda person. What but are you I'm doing this? I'm going to do this for you. Oh my goodness. This because is not Because I do necessary. this. Yes, I don't. Dr I do drink sparkling water. Oh, I do but not I don't like drink spicy so water. You don't? Yes. Oh. Look so at gonna, our differences. I know. I love it. Well, I'm going to drink some Diet Coke this morning for you. And I could use the caffeine. So I'm not going to say no to that. Okay. But cheers. Cheers. To new friendships. I love it. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Good old Diet Coke. <laughs> you know what? If I'm going to have a Diet Coke, though, With which I haven't for 20 years, but when I was in college, I drank uh -huh. Diet Coke. Do you know that from McDonald's? Yes. <laughs> It is, it's, it's better. There. I don't, I feel like just God's it's, hand is just rested. It is the best diet on that soda machine in McDonald's. Because yes. Yeah. The other day I was like coming back from church and I was like, kids, I just need a diet Coke from McDonald's. And they're like, are you okay? I'm like, I just need one. Like right, right now. now. And the thing is, I think it's cause the syrup and the water get I combined so. at the, oh. mem the moment that you're that dispensing it where this has been combined for uh -huh. a long time. It's so it's a fresh, like. I don't know how to explain it, no, but it is it so is, good. It's just nothing beats it. I'm nothing. glad you get it. I know. I mean, this was back in the day when I, I drank this. And um, I was like, is this a special? It was just regular Diet Coke. Okay. Well, anyways, um, if you guys loved, I mean, I love following you online now. Oh, like somebody you. introduced us and I was like, wow. Um, I just started. It's like you can go down a rabbit hole oh, pretty down. quickly mm -hmm. on your um, account. It's really awesome. And Check out her book, Courageously Soft, Daring to Keep a Tender Heart in a Tough World, which comes out March 19th. March 19th. Just a couple days away. Oh, my goodness. That's awesome. Well, thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Yes. So and wonderful. I hope you guys love this episode. Super awesome um, story. And that's what life's all about is learning from our story. So I hope you guys make some comments, subscribe, tell your friends about it. We'd love for you to share. And we'll see you next time on the Something New Show. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe to the show, rate, review, and share with a friend. Also, follow The Something New Show on Instagram and Facebook. If you want a fuller experience, watch the show on YouTube to help you create a life worth celebrating. 